From Studio A in the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, this is The Hot Seat, and you're in it with me, Max Schwartz. And I'm excited to announce that we are on Skype for the first time. And as my Skype guest today, I have KCAL 9 KCBS TV political reporter Dave Bryan. Thank you very much for joining me today, Mr. Bryan. It is a pleasure to have you on. And it is exciting not only that you are our first Skype interview, but that you I've been watching you since I was little. So to have this opportunity to talk to you is I'm very excited about. Thanks, Max. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate you having me on. Look forward, looking forward to our discussion. And it's my pleasure. And I would just like to say, because this is my first time, you can, if you wouldn't mind pardoning my dust here while I get used to hosting this program on TV and working our brand new beautiful studio in here, which is a live streaming Skype and web stream studio. Uh, before I start, I'd like to make a few notes. One is that not all of my guests will be able to do Skype interviews, so we will still be doing audio podcasts from, po from time to time. And we w I'd like to make a scheduling note that uh, Assemblyman Adrian Nazarian followed Representative Alan Lowenthal, not Atul Singh, uh, for reasons that are out of the hot seats in Mr. Singh's control. So we will be working on rescheduling Mr. Singh. And also, as uh, for those of you who have been following online, we also had Assemblyman Mark Levine, and we've got a lot of other guests who are in the works. So without further ado, I've got a lot of questions and not a lot of time, so, that, so let's get started. So, Mr. Bryan, Jim McDonnell is the newly, relatively new elected sheriff in Los Angeles County, uh, and he was elected amid criminal investigations and federal indictments. Do you believe that and there was high expectations of him for him to change the agency. And without giving opinions, do you believe that expectations were too high? Or is the issue that there is too much institutional mismanagement for him to fix this quickly? Well, I think you're making an assumption here that, that, uh, that things haven't changed. And I'm not sure that that's an accurate assumption. Uh, just last month, Sheriff McDonnell announced a sweeping reform agreement with the federal government that will make major, major changes in the way uh, mentally ill inmates are treated at, at the county jails. And in addition to that, we'll have very strict rules and regulations for use of force in the jail, which has been a serious ongoing problem. Uh, I, I think that if this works the way it's intended to work, it will make a major difference uh, in the way the jails, business is conducted at the jails, the way uh, inmates are treated, the way sheriff's deputies conduct themselves, even in the way that guests who come to visit inmates are treated, and you know that has been an issue as well. There's a, there are a long list of issues for the sheriff's department. I think for someone who's been in office uh, 11 months or was elected just 11 months ago, uh, it's you know it, it's it's a uh, a staggering list of things uh, that need addressing and need to be changed. But I do think. Uh, that this agreement may go a long way, again, if it works the way it's supposed to. When the agreement was announced, the U.S. attorney said it is a landmark agreement, and a deputy assistant attorney general said these reforms mark a new day, a new day for the treatment of prisoners at the Los Angeles jails, and represent a critical step forward in restoring public trust and confidence in the criminal justice system. Again, it remains to be seen how this is carried out. But I don't think you can, um, you know, under, uh, underestimate the potential, at least, uh, of this uh, having a major impact on one of the real true problem areas facing the L.A. County Sheriff's Department, and that is the jails in Los Angeles County. Now, in addition to that, just last week, uh, the sheriff announced a new policy uh, for how the Sheriff's Department will handle its contacts with ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And that agreement or that a plan that he has announced uh, would affect um, the, the situation where, uh, he says, uh, those who have been convicted of serious or violent crimes and are not in the country legally will be allowed to be interviewed by ICE and ultimately perhaps deported if, if, if that's what's decided is necessary. Now, that a proposal by the sheriff, that plan uh, for how to conduct uh, business with ICE between the LA County Sheriff's Department did raise controversy. There's no question about it. And we, in fact, did a story, a report on it just last week about those who are dissatisfied, don't trust the Sheriff's Department to carry out uh, the plan uh, that the sheriff announced and, and are waiting to see and, and more aggressively are criticizing it uh, because they say that it will lead to racial profiling and it will lead to stereotyping, uh, particularly, uh, you know, in many cases, the Latino 
inmates who, who may be undocumented. So again, it's still a work in progress, but I think even most of the critics agree, if it works the way that McDonald says he expects it to work and is planning for it to work, and that's a big if, uh, then, then I think uh, the, several of the people that I've talked to who raise serious, serious criticisms and doubts about it say uh, that they would be satisfied as long as it's confined to those who have committed and been convicted of committing violent and serious felony crimes, not someone who was driving without a license, for example, which, which uh, things like that did happen all the time in the past. That is very true, and I do agree with you that change has been done. I don't mean to imply there was no, ch there, was, there hasn't been a change since he's been elected. There have obviously been some reforms, but my question to you is, and I understand if you can't answer because of your regular interactions with the Sheriff's Department with county government, do you think, or do, would you have, did you expect him to do more by this point than what he's actually done? Uh, you know, truthfully, um, I, I, I've known McDonald for many years, since he was at LAPD, then he was the police chief in Long Beach. Um, he, this is the way he works. I mean, he, you know, I, I'm not doing a, a commercial for the guy, but he's got a good reputation. He's had a good record both at LAPD and in Long Beach. He, he gets things done but he doesn't rush out. He's not a guy who's looking to get on TV or, or to get into the newspapers. He's not looking for publicity. He doesn't, he doesn't get out and do a, a you know, charm offensive uh, about uh, what, what it is that he's doing. Um, so uh, you know, I think in many cases that some of these actions don't get a, a, a lot of coverage. Um, I, I, I think, you know, I, again, I'm not going to say he's doing a good job or a bad job. I don't, I think that's, I don't think that's, you know, my purpose or what I'm here for. I'm, I'm here to just say this is what he's done. There are still a lot of problems with the department that need addressing. There's absolutely no question about it. And, and I think, you know, there are critics uh, who raise the question of whether he's moving with enough urgency and, and addressing the problems in a um, comprehensive way uh, to fix them. But, but I do also believe that these are complex problems in many cases. And, and, and in some cases, they involve the culture of the sheriff's department. It's hard to change the culture in a department of thousands and thousands of deputies. Or you may remember the LAPD had similar problems in, in its relationship with minority communities, in its use of, of violence, uh, in, in, in putting down peaceful demonstrations. If you go back years to the Rodney King incident, um, the LAPD had a, had a terrible, terrible reputation in many communities. And, and it took a long time and several chiefs, you know, uh, since then, since those problems to, to have fixed them. So uh, it hasn't moved as quickly, I think, as, as some people would like, but, but there are things that have, have been done. Yes, and I'm sure a lot of people would agree that most of the problems were institutional, not just Sheriff Baca based, and they wouldn't magically disappear overnight. However, would you, do you think, because you cover both sides of the story, do you think that people had too high of expectations for the sheriff? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, uh, I, I haven't really seen any polling about whether people feel the sheriff is doing a good job or not. I, I don't really know. I, I have to say, I haven't done any research on, uh, you know, people's reactions to, to what he has or hasn't done so far. I, I'm not sure. Uh, and, and, and I want to ask you, but I don't mean to, you know, be asking you questions, but that's what I do. I mean, is that's there fine. something specifically that you're referring to, you know, has someone or some group said, hey, this is not acceptable, he's not moving quickly enough? Well, part of what I, from my understanding of covering it and from also talking to other journalists, people had the expectation that three to six months in, he was going to start making institutional reforms and uh, high-profile personnel changes, it doesn't necessarily seem, at least that I've observed, that those high-profile changes and those institutional reforms, other than what's happened with the jails, has actually taken place. And I know people were hoping there, there'd be reforms to the discipline policy and that you would start to see a culture shift uh, with at least under his management style. And I don't know if that's necessarily been apparent yet, other than that he's, from my understanding, is he's a stickler on the way deputies should dress and conduct themselves, which I guess is seen on the micro level, but over a comprehensive change, I don't believe has appeared yet, and at least the people I've spoken with haven't, hasn't, they haven't seen it either.
I see. Well, again, I, you know, I, I cover a lot of different subjects and the Sheriff's Department is not necessarily, uh, you know, a, an area that I specifically focus on in great detail. So uh, I'm, I'm just not aware of that. I haven't heard a lot of criticism. Uh, I, I understand there's, there's a, a, a lot of sentiment for moving quickly because the problems are so serious and so deeply ingrained um, in the department. Um, so uh, you're, you're ahead of me in that respect. Um, I do think that he has done some things in terms of disciplining deputies who have been uh, involved in incidents uh, where things were not handled properly. Um, so, and, and I think, I think, you know, even the uniform uh, restrictions, I think, uh, can be seen as an effort to uh, maybe superficial, certainly in some respects, but also I think uh, it instills a certain level of, um, of professionalism uh, in, in the department. So it's not where, hey, you just dress the way you want to, or you can play it fast and loose and that's okay. No, it's not. You got to dress properly. You have to you have to abide by the rules, and we're going to enforce them. So um, yeah, and, and the other thing is, I don't necessarily know that you see cultural changes, uh, you know, very quickly. I think it takes time to change the culture, but it also takes time uh, for for those on the outside to to see evidence that that culture has changed. You know, it's not something necessarily that makes headlines. That's a very good point. And stay, just saying on one more question about the sheriff, because we yeah. have because of the recent immigration protocol, which sort of conflicts with what the supervisors did with item 187G over the summer, which is when they sort of kicked ICE out of the jail, the, yeah. ICE, the permanent ICE office out of the jails. One, if you can answer, were you surprised by the sheriff's change of policy? And also, have you, in your political reporting career, have you seen a time, even though the sheriff's perfectly allowed to do this because he in this case he is an independently elected official so uh, the sheriff in this county or in any other county you cover conflict with the board of supervisors oh i think sheriff baca conflicted with uh, the board of supervisors a lot <laughs> on a variety of issues mainly budget uh, issues but but i think on, on some other issues as well so i don't think it's entirely um, unheard of or unusual mainly for the reason you said the sheriff is independently elected and while he does answer to the Board of Supervisors, uh, it's, it's not, you know, it's kind of a murky relationship in terms of uh, how much independence the sheriff actually has uh, or doesn't have. Um, and, I, and I do think that um, there are, I think, I, I wasn't surprised in, in his proposal for uh, defining the relationship between the county sheriff's department, the jails, and ICE, uh, because I think there were some events that, that happened um, to sort of pressure, brought pressure uh, to do that. One was the murder of the young lady in San Francisco over the summer, um, a case where uh, the, the suspect who was charged with committing that crime is undocumented, not in the country legally, and had been held in custody, but was released without ICE being notified in Northern California. And I think that was a case that Donald Trump even used, you know, in his uh, presidential campaign. Um, and it, it has put a lot of pressure and raised a lot of questions. And um, I think what, uh, what McDonald's trying to do is to sort of walk that very, very tightrope line um, between respecting the rights of, of undocumented immigrants on the one hand, but um, ensuring public safety on the other hand. And I think he feels that this is, this is the uh, best balance uh, that, that he could reach. Now, again, you know, there have been, there have been plenty of critics who said, well, we're going to go back to the same bad old days of stereotyping every Latino as a criminal and sort of playing off of, of what Trump has, has been saying in some respects. Uh, you know, they're all murderers and, and, and rapists and, and drug dealers and so on and so forth. I think that's the fear of those who are criticizing this plan. And they want to see evidence that that's not going to happen. Um, and, and, you know, that certainly there's a, a, a case to be made that, uh, that, that after what they've been through, they should see that evidence. Yes, but I think, as most people would say, it's too early to give any of that evidence because this yeah. was just enacted. And moving on now to the County Board of Supervisors, and I know you can't comment a lot, but I do. I, I think I can form this question in a way that you'd be able to comment. What changes have you seen in the new Board of Supervisors with Sheila Kuehl and Hilda Solis versus the old Board of Supervisors with Zevior Slavsky and, uh, pardon me, Gloria Molina? Gloria Molina, yeah. 
Well, I think that uh, the board is is uh, more liberal now, um, and and I think it's pro it's unmistakable. They have a very clear um, three to two majority now on on issues uh, like that. Uh, I think you know the the fifteen dollar minimum wage plan um, passed by the board of supervisors uh, that they are committing. Uh, the board says it's committing more than two hundred million dollars to deal with the homeless problem, much as the city of, of Los Angeles is, is preparing to do the same thing to the tune of $100 million. And I think, I think even the construction plan for a new jail, a smaller jail, they say, uh, that will focus more on alternatives to sending people to jail, particularly the, the mentally ill and, and people who have uh, psychological or mental problems in some way, um, that you know, currently makes up by some estimates 20% of the inmates in the LA County jails uh, who need some psychological help. And, um, and in many cases, it, it hasn't been available. So um, I, think, I think there are things that uh, Sheila Kuehl and Hilda Solis can point to to say, uh, look, we haven't been here that long. Again, just, just elected, you know, last year, late last year. Um, and, and we're making changes. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're pushing, uh, pushing the, uh, the envelope a little bit to make changes uh, that are really important and affect people's lives. I mean, at least that's what they're saying. And, and um, I think, I think uh, the jury is still out. I mean, I, I think that, uh, again, I, you know, I hate to keep saying the same, same tune over and over, but it's, it's still pretty early. And I think they have, have had some legislative victories uh, that are actually concrete and that they can talk about. Okay, and moving on now to the city of Los Angeles, and you talked about the $100 million homelessness issue. The, there's, I saw when that announcement came out, I had a few instances of shock. One is, where are they getting $100 million from? Did you have a similar reaction? And yeah. I still don't know where it's coming from. Do you? I, I don't, and I, and I think that's, that's the $64,000 question, just to throw another money amount into, into the issue. Uh, where is the money coming from? I think I think that's a very good question. No doubt, you know, some of it will come from um, from private sources, some uh, foundations, and, and so forth. Uh, some of it may come from the federal government, various programs available to address homeless problems. But the the, the lion's share will have to come from the city. And um, last time I checked, I, I didn't see that the city had a hundred million dollar surplus or any kind of surplus in any way, shape, or form. So. Uh, I think I think that's a very good question, and I think there's been some criticism just the, over the weekend and uh, the last few days that the council seems to be acting as if there is no budget deficit in Los Angeles, and that may come as news to, to many city officials and residents. So I guess it's one of those issues where time will tell. And st staying on the topic of money, it, ta it takes a lot of money to put on an Olympics. There yeah. is an expectation of revenue from this because the LA, the city of Los Angeles has existing facilities. But in terms of LA 24, do you believe it is worth it, if you can give your opinion, for the city of Los Angeles to put on the Olympics despite the cost and the, po the great possibility that we, it could go over budget and the fact that we don't know how many permanent jobs will actually be created? Well, I, I, you know, I don't give my opinion, my personal opinion, because I don't think that's what I'm here for uh, as a reporter and an analyst. But I will say that uh, there are some pretty serious questions. And um, the biggest question, uh, the real sticking point here is that the host city contract under the contract uh, that would be agreed to by the city of Los Angeles would still put taxpayer dollars at risk by making the city ultimately responsible if the privately managed games wind up in debt. And it certainly wouldn't be the first time that has happened. Uh, yeah. The London, London Olympics in 2012 barely broke even. China made an operating profit, they say, of about $140 million from hosting the uh, 2008 Olympics. And Athens uh, accrued a debt burden of around $14 billion. And some say that's still a part of the financial liability that contributed to the eventual Greek debt crisis. So... There is certainly, you know, there's certainly some danger and, and there's plenty of liability here if things don't work out um, the way the very optimistic LA 2024 Olympic Committee is suggesting. Like you say, they're saying that the city will make a profit uh, of about $160 million. Um, I don't know, we'll see. And while many existing facilities um, would be used, uh, like the Staples Center, the Rose Bowl and the Coliseum, uh, doesn't mean that this is expense-free for, for Los Angeles. 
first of all, the biggest thing is you have to build an Olympic village. Which is um, on private, which they want to be on privately held land, which is part yeah. of their problem. Yeah, and that's, that's no small task, nor is, a, is it a cheap endeavor. And there are a million other costs associated with this. Um, you know, the, the committee says uh, that uh, ticket sales and, and, and other, other sources of revenue, um, including, you know, private contributions, again, by foundations and other groups to put this on, uh, will, will cover uh, almost the entire expense and then actually uh, produce a small profit. But, uh, you know, I think that, um, that city residents might feel a lot more comfor comfortable if there was an actual independent analysis, not one done by the committee trying to convince the Olympics to come to Los Angeles that would suggest the same thing. And Herb Weston, going back to the contract, Herb Weston insists that he'll be able to change the contract and make it so that way LA is not liable. Uh, we'll see when that, we'll see if that actually happens. And the other point on this is that there's a reason why Beijing has the 2018 Winter Olympics when they don't have snow. <laughs> That's right. So yeah, yeah. I do have, uh, I want to move to federal now. We're running short on time. But quickly, the pending, the most urgent subject is that of a possible government shutdown. I know you don't give your opinion, so I'm not going to ask, do you think there's going to be a government shutdown or not? But No, I can, I can talk about that. That's, that's not a matter of opinion. Um, well, do you think, think there will be a government shutdown? Well, I don't think so right now. Uh, now, you know, it's a very fluid situation, as we say in the political world. But at the moment, it does not appear that there will be a government shutdown. Because, a shutdown because remember, Speaker Boehner is going to stay in office until the end of October, and so he uh, and he and some Repu Republicans, moderate Republicans and Democrats, are expected to vote for a temporary temporary budget reprieve uh, that will not include defunding Planned Parenthood, which is the sticking point in this particular issue. And that is expected to happen, certainly before Wednesday, because that's the deadline. If it's not done by Wednesday, then the government does start shutting down. So um, it would be a shock if that doesn't happen. Uh, Mitch McConnell in the Senate said that um, he's, he's ready to take that up on the Senate side. And it looks like that will go through um, as early as tomorrow, maybe, uh, or as late as tomorrow, I guess, if you're looking at the Wednesday deadline. But um, at least for the, for the short run, there doesn't appear to be uh, much prospect of a government shutdown now over this issue. We, we can't forget, though, the Tea Party wing in the Senate that, has been respon that was responsible for the last government shutdown. Yeah, I, and I'm not suggesting we should forget them. But with about 50 votes, they're not necessarily in a position to call the shots on this one. Because remember, uh, Boehner is talking about passing this with... A substantial, a substantial number of Republican votes and Democratic votes in the House. So he, he appears pretty confident. Um, most, of, most of the leadership in, in the House is, seems to be confident that they can pass this without any problem. And uh, at least I say, in, a short, on, in the short run, on a temporary basis, uh, it doesn't appear the government will be shutting down after Wednesday. It, it would be, I would say, um, 75 25 that that's not going to happen maybe maybe 90 10 you know just again for the short run this is not the final solution but at least it, it appears it will avert a shutdown this week of the government okay and one final question for you on the note of speaker boehner because the most recent news is that he's resigning some wouldn't call it a shock others would and there's been a lot of talk about having sorry there's been a, it's okay there's been a lot of talk about having Representative Kevin McCarthy of Bakersfield be the next speaker, and some yeah. are thinking he's a shoe in I don't necessarily believe that. Are you, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that the Tea Party is going to have a say in who's speaker? Well, they're sure trying. I mean, they're, they're, they've got a couple of uh, representatives uh, whose names have been mentioned as possible alternatives to McCarthy, but uh, again, I, I think it appears to be a real long shot for them. Um, uh, like I say, with, with 50 or 60 uh, votes in the House, um, it doesn't mean to say they won't attract other votes. I mean, there's certainly other conservative uh, Republicans in the caucus, no question about that. Um, but I think at least for the moment, uh, McCarthy is the overwhelming favorite um, to be elected. And unless something changes between now and when the caucus makes that decision, I think it would be shocking if he wasn't chosen right now. Um, the thing about McCarthy is that He's sort of had it both ways. He's been an, an ally, obviously, of Boehner, which is how part of how he became majority leader. 
and he's known as um, not necessarily being a moderate, but less conservative uh, than, than the more extreme elements of the Tea Party and some of the evangelical representatives. Um, but uh, by the same token, and he has raised money for, for many of their candidates. That, that's a big deal for them. Uh, he has done a lot of fundraising uh, for Tea Party candidates and others who would tend to be, you know, in that more conservative group of the caucus. But ideologically and in terms of how he votes uh, and in terms of his rhetoric, I, I don't think that he necessarily fits in with a more conservative uh, wing of the Republican Party. So what will be interesting will be to see how he deals with that and whether he deals with it any differently than, than Mr. Boehner did. Um, because there's certainly, if not, you know, there certainly will be problems coming up. This is not the last time that this schism in the Republican Party is going to show its face. Well, thank you very much for that, Mr. Bryan, and thank you very much for calling in via Skype. It was a pleasure. We'll have to save presidential politics for next time, and the Democratic debate is coming up on, this, on, Oct on October 13th, so that should be very interesting. And so thank you very much for joining me today, and everybody, you can, follow, you can still follow... Uh, the, you can still contact me after hours for the hot seat after hours by tweeting me at Max Schwartz TV and you can follow us and you can subscribe to the hot seats newsletter by clicking on the link on our page go to annenbergradio.org slash podcast and click on the link underneath the hot seats description and enter your email address from studio a in the usc annenberg school for communication and journalism i'm max schwartz and we will see you next time good day